Hello and welcome back to Minotaur Hotel. Uh, last we saw, we were getting introduced to Coda and this mysterious Jean, or Jean, I, I really don't know how to pronounce the name, <laughs> um, was basically giving him hints that perhaps what Coda is seeking, which is apparently another dragon, might be related to or might be showing up at the Minotaur Hotel. So I guess we'll just jump right in. Hot. So hot. But not the heat he has been craving. This is dry. Lifeless. This land is cursed. The dragon trudges along the side of the highway, tongue lolling from his open mouth like panting dogs. His supply of bottled water ran dry long ago, and now the sweat has completely dried from both his yukata and his brow leaving the desolation of the desert around him to seep into his bones and his breast. It feels wrong to the dragon, just like slipping into the flowing stream earlier felt right. How long has it been since he left Jean behind? It swims away, a fish darting just out of the reach of his fingers. He was there in the forest, and now he is here in the desert. And there, looming on the horizon, is the hotel the man told him about. It rises from the other side of the hill, looking almost out of place in the sandy expanse stretching towards the horizon in every direction. The style is one that Coda hasn't seen in quite a long while, and the disrepair the building is in is readily apparent even from this distance. It wasn't like the dragon was expecting a bustling hub, with polished and shiny doors never having a chance to swing closed around the tide of travelers making their way in and out. But the place looks about as desolate as the surrounding desert. Still, Coda is here, and while the sight before him makes his heart sink just the smallest bit, the dragon still trudges onward. Down the sandy hill, working a sharp rock out of his sandal with his toes as he goes, along the road feeling the heat of the blacktop against the scales of his legs, curving slightly as he follows the driveway into the parking lot. Forward, forward, always forward. Koda struggles to make his way up the steps to the building's front door, as the fatigue of his journey begins to set in, he has to stop, leaning against the wall to catch his breath. Up close, the hotel looks at least a little better. The dragon can see the places where the effort has been made to patch up the worst of the wear. The repairs look fairly recent. Someone has been here. With a final deep breath, Koda pushes the door open. Hello? The dragon barely recognizes his own voice, as dry and dusty as it is. He coughs, hacking and gasping and swallowing to wet his throat, and then tries again. Hello? Sir, are you all right? Before Coda can answer, another coughing fit rocks his weary body. He feels a presence rush forward to wrap an arm around his back, and the dragon is led forward into the cool hotel lobby. His host lowers him into a chair, the world blinking for a moment, then a glass of water is pushed into Coda's hand. Koda haphazardly bows in gratitude before opening his maw wide to gulp down the cool liquid. It's not much, but that little bit of moisture settles into it and revitalizes the dragon. He swallows, holds the glass out to be taken by a large, fur-covered hand, and looks up at its host. Oh, uh... Please pardon my intrusion, and forgive my shameful display. It's no trouble. I am happy to offer assistance. By the way, I forgot how to make these voices, I'm sorry. I forget these things in like the span of a week. Uh, thank you. The dragon takes a slow, deep breath, and then another. And another. The soreness settles into his weary limbs, fading slightly as it spreads through his whole body. Koda takes the opportunity to look around the hotel lobby, examining both the room and the hotel's apparent owner. Oh, pardon me. Welcome to the hotel, sir. I am Asterion, the keeper of this fine establishment. The master is otherwise occupied at the moment, but I would be happy to introduce you later. For now, please let me know if there is anything that I can do for you, or any questions I can answer. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. I've heard about your hotel's opening, and wish to see it for myself. And I must say I am pleased. I have never seen a Minotaur in my life. I traveled all around the globe, 
seen all sorts of beings. But I always thought Minotaurs were only a legend. This place truly must be special for such a rare specimen to be here. Although... The dragon looks around the empty lobby. The half-man, half-bull keeper seems able to easily read Coda's expression and offers him another low bow. Yes, the hotel reopened just recently, and we've only just started accepting guests. In fact, it's embarrassing to say, but you're among our first in a long while. Regardless, you are welcome to stay for as long as you like. The dragon hums in thought, letting his claws brush through and tug at it at his beard. The words Jean spoke at the parting which had spurned him on through the trek along the desert road outside tees against the back of his mind once more. Again he looks around the empty lobby and then up at, to Asterion's face. Behind his servile facade, the half-man half bull half looks eager, his hooves clop faintly against the tile as he shifts from one to the other, and an almost childish earnestness flickers behind his polite smile, made no less friendly by the missing half of Asterion's face. The hotel seems to be about as run down as its keeper, but there's potential there. Hope. Thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. I would be happy to stay for at least a little while. I have very little money, but I would be glad to perform any tasks you need that would allow me to earn a bed and a hot meal. That won't be necessary, sir. This is our soft opening, so we won't charge you. In fact, we charge very little regularly, so money is not an issue. As long as the hotel is able to fulfill its mission. Asterion moves to pick the ledger and a pen up off the front desk and brings it over to the dragon. Just sign here and fill out a little bit of information. After a few moments of writing, the half-man half-bull accepts the ledger back from Coda and looks over the new guest's information. Coda has been checked into the hotel. <laughs> you can see your current guests on the guest's screen in the menu, or clicking on the ledger icon. Mr. Coda, no surname, born February the 2nd, 1615. I must say, you are looking very well for your age, sir. Coda blinks, frowns, holds his hand out for the ledger. Excuse me, may I see that for a moment? He looks over his writing. Gena, one. Fifth day of the first month, exactly the way that he had written it. I did not realize that you could read Japanese, Mr. Asterion. Japanese, sir? And that's when it hits Koda. The shape of his tongue, as he had spoken to the Minotaur, all this time had seemed strange. And only now does he realize that, after his coughing fit, he'd switched to his native language without realizing it. And yet, Asterion has been able to understand him. In fact, the half-man, half-bull didn't even seem to realize that Coda was speaking another language. How? Ah, I see. I understand now. Don't be alarmed, sir. It is just a quirk of the hotel. It allows us to understand all the guests that pass through our doors, no matter what country they hail from or language that they choose to speak. I myself am from the Mediterranean, far away from here. So, you can rest assured that all guests are welcome no matter where they come from. I should also add, I can see you are a dragon. Enchantments do not work here. But worry not, that is allowed here. All who are lost are welcome. A place for wanderers indeed. I see. The dragon stands and offers Asterion a deep bow of his own. If what both John and this half-man half-bull said is true, then perhaps this is exactly where Coda needs to be. Thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. You honor me with your hospitality. Asterion moves to set the ledger back onto the front desk and returns to Coda with a key. He passes it to the dragon while giving Coda another welcoming smile. Here is your key, Mr. Coda. If you would like, I can show you to your room. I hope that you have an enjoyable stay with us. Chapter 6, Housewarming It's been an hour or so since Asterion left the lounge. The Minotaur had led you back to the hotel's hearth to check on it. Everything seemed to be in working condition. You both did the rounds and inspect the hotel. The rooms, the stairways, the lobby, and every lamp and switch and the door you could find. 
Some of the walls were still cracked, windows were smashed, and there was water damage here and there. The sight displeased Asterion, but the hotel seemed to be repairing itself at an impressive rate. You both stopped at the lounge to take a break and celebrate it, a job well done. Asterion served your favorite drink again and, with your permission, took a glass of wine himself. After a brief chat, you checked the time only to notice your phone's battery was long dead. But the hotel has power now. You wished for a socket to plug your phone in, and after a blink, it materializes before you. Asterion was eager to resume the inspection. You were enjoying the break, so you let him continue without you. The time alone proved beneficial. So much has happened in the last few days, meeting the old man, finding the hotel and the Minotaur inside, the altercation with Argos. After a drink and some time, you didn't feel as overwhelmed. All the craziness seemed to be under control. You check in on your phone after spending a couple of hours in an armchair by the hearth. It had barely charged 3% of the battery. It probably won't remain on for more than a minute. As you head back to the couch to sit down, you hear a sound that has grown familiar to you over these few days. Asterion's hooves clopping towards you. Good afternoon, master. Hello, Asterion. Are you done with your inspection? Well, I had to cut it short. I don't want to disturb you, but I have very good news. Asterion walks up to you at a brisk pace, an excited pace, and hands you the ledger. He stands there, waiting for you to open it. He shifts his weight from one hoof to the other, and his tail swishes back and forth in unison with his flickering ears. Coda. Just Coda, huh? Wait a second. 1615? I was born many centuries ago as well, master. Generally, our guests are human, but not all of them. I'm still getting used to it, Asterion. Well, I'll have to see this for myself now. You look like a kid on Christmas Eve, you know. Please excuse me, master. I just I haven't had guests in so long. Well, I can't wait to meet this guy. I'm intrigued. You think he's in his room now? I suppose so, yes. I'd rather not disturb the guests, but... This is a special occasion, isn't it? Perhaps this one time. You are about to head to the new guest's room when you hear footsteps approaching the lounge. The footsteps are slow and even, carefully measured, as though the one approaching is taking his sweet time to take in his surroundings. They're accompanied by a faint sound, keeping time with each step. A quiet, simple tune, hummed in a deep, rumbling voice. The melody is like the flowing of a stream, steady and constant. When your first guest arrives at the lounge, his eyes are already wandering up and down to catch the grandeur and lingering decay of the place. He seems to be lost in thought as he examines the leather couches, the hearth, the tables and chairs. It's only when Asterion clears his throat with a polite cough that the dragon seems to realize that you're there. I trust the accommodations are to your liking, Mr. Coda. Ah, Mr. Asterion, they are indeed. Thank you. Forgive me, I was just looking around. It's alright, go on and make yourself at home. The dragon, Mr. Coda, looks over to you as he speaks up. He offers you a low bow and a polite smile. Thank you very much for your hospitality. I take it that you're the master that Mr. Asterion mentioned at Chicken? That's right, I'm in charge of this place. My name is Emilio. You offer your hand to the dragon and he takes it in his own after a moment of hesitation. I'm glad to have you here with us, and I hope your stay is enjoyable, Mr. Coda. The dragon gives you another shallower bow as he shakes your hand with a firm grip. Thank you again, Master Emilio. Asterion clears his throat again, gaining the dragon's attention once more. Is there anything I can get for you this time, Mr. Coda? A meal? Or a drink, perhaps? Oh, no, no. Thank you very much, but as I said, I am just looking around right now. Perhaps later. Very well. Then, if I may be so bold as to ask, what do you think of our Vine Hotel so far? It's... nice. A little more run down than I had pictured, and I would have thought that there would already be guests. But I suppose that's what I get for getting my hopes up. Ah. I... I see. The Minotaur tries to keep his face neutral, but you can tell that Coda's words have cut deep. The hotel is Asterion's pride and joy, and to have it criticized by the first guest in years like that must hurt. <laughs> it's 
If you don't like it, you can leave, bitch. If it's not up to your standards, you're free to leave at any time. The door is right out there and down the hall. I'm pretty sure you won't find a better place for miles, but hey, if you want to head back out into the desert, it's your choice. I sincerely apologize. I am ashamed to have insulted my gracious host, so... Despite how things look now, I can tell that this was once a grand place. I can see the beauty of it, even under all the dust and decay. Although, if it's just the two of you, then I imagine that it will take quite a while to restore its former glory, and there are no other staff here? It may surprise you, but Asterion and I can get a lot done. Still, yes, we are looking for people willing to join our staff. Asterion, can you tell Mr. Coda how things worked here back then? Yes, before issues arose with the previous manager, it was quite common for guests to choose to remain here indefinitely. Most didn't have anywhere else to go, you see, and we could pay reasonably well. Or, we should soon enough, seeing as a hotel does not aim to generate profits. And the guests who join our staff get to enjoy all of the hotel's facilities for as long as they want, free of charge. Indeed. Hmm. The dragon begins brushing his claw through his long beard, looking from you to Asterion and back again. Finally, a spark of resolve shines in his eyes. Mr. Asterion, back when I checked in, I offered my services in exchange for being allowed to stay. If you two are in need of staff, then I would be happy to help in any way that I can repay the hospitality that you two have shown me. I've worked many odd jobs over my years of traveling, and I have gained a variety of skills. Cooking, cleaning, a few years doing manual labor. I may not look it. The dragon pats the round, firm rise of his belly with a laugh. But my body is solid. I even spent a few months as a bartender, back... Hmm... 20 years ago? Thirsty? Speaking honestly, I enjoy the job the most. The conversations with others, tales swapped and secrets divulged, to be kept in confidence... Finding the right drink for your customer, the one that would soothe their worries and help to ease their burdens, at least for the little time that they would spend at the counter. The dragon's expression grows pensive and his gaze distant. When you glance over to Asterion, you see a similar look in the Minotaur's eyes as he lets out a thoughtful hum. The moment is broken as Coda shakes himself out of his revere. He gives you a rueful smile. Forgive me, I get lost and reminisce sometimes. My point is that I can do anything that you need of me, I'm happy to help. You can feel Asterion's eyes on you. When you glance to the bowl, you see him slightly begging your permission to speak. If you have something to say, then go ahead, Asterion. Very well, Master Emilio. The lounge could use the services of a good bartender, though I can perform the role well enough. I do have other duties as keeper which come first. Management of the lounge has often been delegated to a suitable guest in the past. I think it would be in good hands with you behind the counter, Mr. Coda. Well then, that works out perfectly. In the country of my birth, I was often said that the fortune falls in the wake of dragons. Though I cannot benefit from it myself, I am happy to offer it to my gracious hosts. Believe me, we can use all the good luck we can get. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I wanted to ask you something, Mr. Coda. You said earlier that you got your hopes up before coming here. Where were you hoping to find? I see nothing gets past you, Master Emilio. You say nothing and allow the dragon to gather his thoughts. For years, centuries, no, I have been looking for something, someone dear to me, who was lost a long time ago. I've traveled the entire world searching for him, but so far I haven't had any luck, no matter where I've gone or how many people I've asked. When I heard about this hotel opening, I thought perhaps there would be someone here who could offer a lead in my search. This hotel is a place for wanderers to gather, is it not? The dragon bows and his expression grows blank. However, you can see desperation flash in his eyes for just a moment. The desperation of a man who's come so close to his goal only to have the rug pulled out from under him time and time again. If you will allow me to stay here, to speak with the other guests and hear their tales of wandering, perhaps I will find the lead that I've been searching for. And do you plan to leave once you've found it? 
Again, the dragon's eyes flash. Will I be allowed to? Of course. This hotel was not meant to be a prison. For the guests, at least. You will be free to leave once you found what you are looking for, Mr. Coda. Or whenever you wish so, naturally. I don't plan to disappear in the middle of the night, if that worries you. I'll be sure to make arrangements so that my departure doesn't inconvenience you. I don't know for how long it will be before I find what I'm looking for anyway. Until that time comes, I may as well do my part as your guest, right? Again, you take a look at Asterion. It looks like the monitor has already made up his mind about taking Coda on as staff. The hotel's mission is to take in those who are lost. Going by what you've told us tonight, it would seem that you fit the bill. Are you willing and ready to uphold the hotel's mission and bow to the owner's authority? How formal! I haven't heard a contract of service put in quite that way in centuries. It makes me feel nostalgic. As long as I am free to pursue my own agenda, then yes, for the duration of my stay in the hotel, I will happily serve in any way that I can. Well, Sir Emilio, with your command, I can have it all arranged. What do you say? Seeing as Mr. Coda swore our oath already, all you need to say is, Mr. Coda, hereby you are taken into this hotel as staff to fulfill its mission and to serve as the manager of the lounge. Fancy, huh? Very well, Coda. Hereby you are taken as staff of this hotel to fulfill its mission and work as the manager of the lounge. You offer your handshake. Coda takes your hand in both of his, and once again gives you a low bow. His smile is placid, but his eyes are shining with an earnest light you hadn't noticed when you first met the dragon. The lights in the hotel shift for a second, right after you both let go of each other's hand. What was that? Worry not, Mr. Coda. It is just another quirk of the hotel. As you have been taken on as staff member in charge of the lounge, you are hereby given free authority to shape it as you please. I have fond memories of this lounge's current layout, but the labyrinth has always shifted its appearance throughout the years. Maybe it's time to give it an update. Well, it could look more modern. In truth, I can appreciate the way it looks. It's a thing of beauty, even as it is now. He runs his clawed hand over the bar top. Again, the softly humped tune rumbles in his throat. Old and new, something that appeals to a traditional sensibility, and yet is welcoming to all types. Mr. Coda? Ah, forgive me. I was lost and reminisce again. I was thinking about the bar I used to work in. Would it be stepping beyond my bonds to give the lounge a personal touch? Please feel free. In that case, I think I have a few ideas that you may like. One by one the lights flicker as you approve one by one the lights flicker as you approve Coda's request. He looks to you to gauge your reaction to each change, as well as Asterion's. Let's add a little more light, yes? Oh, but keep the dark wood, in fact. Do you mind if we make it a little darker? Hmm. Some more seating would be nice. Here, and here. Oh, this area around the hearth would be perfect. Please, Mr. Coda. My only request is that you don't alter that area too much. Alright. How about over here, then? Coda continues to add his own personal touch to the lounge, lamps in the shape of paper lanterns hanging over the bar counter, traditional Japanese artwork on the walls, intricately folded napkins at every table. Dragon attack achievement. By the time you are done, the old lounge has turned into a brightly lit restaurant that strikes a delicate balance between traditional and modern. Coda continues to examine every detail. It seems like he won't be satisfied until everything is exactly perfect. Asterion looks around, a thoughtful expression on the Minotaur's own face. It looks... amazing. Good work, Mr. Coda. Oh, please. I suppose if I am to be staying here for a while, then just Coda will be alright. In that case, just Emilio and Asterion will be alright for us. Deal. Well now, I think this place is looking much better already. Warm, welcoming. If you do not mind me saying, it already feels like some place I could call a home. At least, for the time being. A home. 
That sounds good to me. How about we have a drink to celebrate? We can tell you more about how things work around here, and how they will work once we start getting more guests. Koda goes over to the counter, grabs a beer mug, and returns to you. Alright, I will whip something up, shall I? I look forward to working with both of you, Asterion and Emilio. Cheers! Chapter 7, A Moment of Weakness You spend the rest of the day with Asterion and Coda in the lounge, admiring the change in decor, sharing drinks, and exchanging stories. Coda had some interesting stories to tell about his life on the road. You recounted some of yours. In turn, a classmate asked for your help to deal with a bully, and you managed to make the two of them become good friends. Or that time you took a skinny friend of yours as a gym buddy. You taught him the ropes and trained alongside him. One night, the two of you and his brother, a rugby player, went out for drinks, and that ended with you sleeping with that said brother. Coda was a little apprehensive about your openness at first, but was nonetheless intrigued and impressed by your stories. Asterion kept quiet for most of the conversation about past experiences. His brief answers made clear his apprehension about sharing his story with Coda. Still, the Minotaur had his shy smile throughout the whole night. As soon as the topic turned back to anything less personal, he'd rejoin the conversation. With the aid of a few glasses of wine, Asterion's posture relaxed, slouched on his chair, eyes half-closed. He was afloat in a sea of bliss. Eventually, it started getting late, and you bid Coda farewell. You and Asterion, meanwhile, returned to the Master's quarters. Asterion stumbles about with you, drowsy but happy. He hums and sways his head back and forth. His hooves add a rhythm which echoes throughout the hallways. When he looks back to you, his one eye has a faint glimmer. Long day, huh? Yes, indeed. It's been so long. Time demanded its due. So much has changed. Peculiar faces, a different lounge, a whole new time, but... I feel like I used to back then, surrounded by friends, talking well into the night. I... I have a purpose again. I cannot thank you enough. It's nothing. No, it is quite something. It is a high honor to serve you, Master. While we're at it, there is something about which I should inform you. It is your right as Master to know, and my duty as Keeper to inform you. Remember that story I told in the lounge? Which one? You told so many. The one about Master Robert and his son, Master Bernard, who I helped raise. Now, where should I start? I asked you today if you liked how I looked, when I tried on my clothes. That was not a trivial question. The master has a right to determine how the keeper should look. That, of course, includes how I should present myself, what my uniform should be. But it goes deeper than that. During Master Bernard's mandate, he deemed that I should have white fur before arriving here. He was a physician, you see, and believed that it would convey cleanliness. Meanwhile, Master Robert always wanted me to have black fur, even as a child. He thought I looked respectable and imposing like that and that he too would seem powerful while riding on my back. I suspect, with time, Master Robert insisted that I have black fur solely to annoy his father. The two of them bickered about it quite often. They'd even exchanged jabs about it during dinner. But, when the father was on his deathbed, he requested a moment to talk in private with each and every one of his descendants. Not so private in reality, I stayed by his bedside to anoint his will, to make sure each and every one would have their corresponding legacy. Midway through, he asked to see me how he remembered me. His son acquiesced, and so I served him until the end. To my unfaltering servant, is what he wrote in the letter. And Sir Robert, to my childhood playmate. This, too, is the master's right. You may choose how I should look. The labyrinth's magic will arrange it. By the oath I have sworn, I will oblige to inform. I am bound to instruct you to the best of my abilities, on all the hotel's capabilities. So you see, my asking master what he thought of my clothes, that was not trivial. Your will is in order. Mm, but why? The why? I have burdened you terribly, my lord, with my rambling. I would prefer not to weigh you down further with unsightly knowledge. But to answer your question in a delicate way, as you can see, I can be healed quickly, 
The special wine I drink is used to hasten the process. I am terribly difficult to injure permanently. The labyrinth allows a master to control my form to an extent, with the goal of making it so that I would not heal from certain injuries, should the master wish it so. Let's pry further. What do you mean by that exactly? I am obliged to answer your question, my lord. If truly it is your wish to know, then I shall tell. There were masters before the hotel who preferred to have my limbs removed. Under normal circumstances, the labyrinth would heal me and return them. Others preferred keeping me beheaded and conscious for months or years. With this power, the master can determine my default shape. But the people of this age are merciful, more so than the first Athenian masters, surely. To them, torturing me was an act of worship. One could say human ingenuity perverted the god's power. Okay, I feel like I should remain quiet, but I'm still gonna poke. The Minotaur shifts back and forth on his hooves. His expression takes on a cold, almost glassy look. By the oath, I am bound. I was killed by decapitation, so the Masters and the Labyrinth found it fitting to use that as the main element of my sentence. When that grew stale, they realized that it was more harrowing to keep me decapitated, but that too became unsatisfying. I thought about the pain and discomfort so often that it would stop making sense. Think about pain for long enough and it stops hurting. So they kept switching it up. Amputations at first, so that they could throw me to the monsters in the valley, and seeing as I had no legs, I wouldn't be able to escape. Then evisceration, when they learned that removing my kidneys and liver brought about unique forms of suffering. Every part of my body has been removed at least a dozen times, then put back and removed again. Some masters were lazy. Instead of innovating on my tortures, they kept me beheaded or ground into a bloody pulp for decades while they enjoyed the labyrinth. This is all possible because it could determine my shape. I have been put under all manners of torture known to man, and then some. Compared to what I've been through, having my first color picked by the master is nothing. I take it any day over being skinned alive and left to fend for myself out in the valley. Now you know. I suppose Master sees where I'm going with this. What is your will, my lord? Uh... White fur is quite striking, but what do you want, Asterion? What color would you rather be? I excuse me? You heard me. What color would you rather be? What do you prefer? I... Uh, master need not worry about what I want. I am the servant. My will shouldn't affect your judgment. But I want to learn more about you. I would appreciate knowing even if you don't think it matters. The Minotaur sighs and bites its lip. You think you displeased him somehow, but then a smile grows, shy as a blossoming flower. It means a lot to me that you asked. It is very kind of you. It is just... Uh, pardon me, I am not used to being asked what I want. The Minotaur turns around and picks up a bottle of wine you had brought from the lounge. With a trained dexterity, he opens it with a corkscrew. Asterion turns back to you, then looks down at the wine glass on the table. He holds the bottle with both hands, like one would hold a cross over one's chest. He steps towards the glass, but pauses and puts the bottle to his hips. You can see his Adam's apple bobbing as he drowns his sorrows. When he meets your gaze again, there is a softness in his eyes you hadn't seen before. If Master wishes my honesty... I would be soothed if I knew Master appreciates me. My fur color is secondary at best compared to that. I suppose I struggle with putting this into words. The Masters have commanded me to change to fit their visions. The same goes for how I should act and address them. And I obeyed eagerly. Because I thought that it would make them like me more. And if they appreciate me, won't they be less likely to send me out to the valley? I will eagerly don whatever color you wish if it will make Master like me more. Perhaps even prize me. It is not often that I have been asked what I want. I am a prisoner after all. Why should the Jailer care for my comfort? That you could extend me such consideration, that is a reason enough for me to rejoice. In which case, it is right I give you an answer. 
one clearer than what I've told you so far. When I was alive, my fur was white. In my dreams, I still see myself with that same white fur. In the waking world, I look down and sometimes I can't withhold a certain surprise to find my out that it isn't the case. After all those years locked away, I had even forgotten what my fur color currently was. If Master wants an answer, that is it. White fur would be nostalgic for me. Still, I'd be happy no matter what, as long as you... As long as you don't hurt me. Please don't feel pressure to consider this in your decision. I am already happy you cared enough to ask. Whatever your choices, I will be cheerful. I won't hurt you, Asterion. I won't hurt you. I understand why you were afraid. I could see myself being suspicious of any new masters after what happened to you. My word might not convince you right now, but I'll say them nonetheless. I won't hurt you. The Minotaur holds on tightly to his bottle of wine. He looks down and bites his lip. A sudden weight seems to bear down on his back. I am only half bull. I am acquainted with the wills of the human heart. Perhaps Master takes pity on me tonight, but I know how fragile human whims are, how they fade so quickly. I... I have thought long and hard over these decades locked away, about this hotel, my sentence, my previous masters, and a young boy I knew. He was around my age. His name was Icarus. His father fashioned wings out of beeswax and feathers for the both of them. But Icarus had the hubris of flying too close to the sun. He fell to his death in the sea below. And we met in Hades after my death. I thought about him, that boy. Had I committed the same mistake by allowing myself to be happy? Joy was never my lot in life. Asterion caresses the table like he would a lover. His nails graze against the wood, clicking just loud enough for you to hear. Much like Icarus, I enjoyed a glimpse of freedom. This hotel was my set of wings. A chilly breeze blows from the window. It sends a shiver down your spine and a sudden stone coldness to Asterion's face. There are promises which cannot be fulfilled, my lord. The hotel knows this will. Not all contracts can be made to have an effect. The labyrinth would not allow one that opposes its stated mission. There was one master who, early in his mandate, tried passing a contract which would forbid any and all from harming me. It would not be made to have an effect. The ink would drip off from it, the paper aged and rotted like milk. Worse still, his charity ran out one day. It is easy to offer one gesture of mercy, but to have it last requires a special kind of intensity. Power reveals what lays underneath. So there were a number of gentle masters who turned sour and grew comfortable with harsh punishments. Even the kindest ones have not shied away from punishing me. It was their mission after all. You and Asterion both stare at each other. He eventually looks away, scratching the left side of his face. I... I... Please forget what I said, my lord. You approach Asterion. You raise your hand and cradle the left side of his face. You run your fingers over his short fur while taking care not to get too close to his injury. Asterion hesitates, but with each caress of your fingers, his eyes close further and he leans his weight against your hand. I promised that I wouldn't send you to the valley, and I won't. And I won't hurt you. Asterion fully supports his weight on your hand. His eyelid flutters, as if he was already falling asleep. You lift your hand and begin petting the right, healthier side of Asterion's face. The Minotaur leans towards you, and you scoot closer to balance his weight. You let the Minotaur have his nap until his ears flick. You give it a gentle rub, and his eyes shoot open. I... Master Emilio. I am sorry. I don't know what got to me. It must be the drowsiness. It won't happen again. He remains with his head in your hands. It's fine. How are you feeling now? I'm well. Good. Asterion hesitates further before prying himself away from you. 
but with a sigh, he does so. Again, I am so sorry. You didn't do nothing wrong. There's no reason for you to say that. As you say, my lord. It's alright, Asterion. I'll be different, don't you worry. I'm gonna go with white fur. Oh, if Master would allow my impertinent inquiry, did you choose white fur because of what I said? As I explained, I am happy enough knowing you care to ask. You need not restrict your choice because of me. Anyhow, if white truly is what you want, then I gladly obey. Asterion closes his eyes and focus. Before your eyes, his fur begins to change. Asterion's fur is now a lustrous white color, as per your request. I am honored with your choice, Master. Asterion heads to the kitchen to prepare your dinner. From time to time you see him staring at his arms while he's cooking. Maybe he's getting used to his new fur color. After a while, Asterion returns to the table, serves you dinner, and sits on the opposite end of the table as usual. When you look up, you are greeted by Asterion's big, dopey smile. He tries to contain himself, but it ends with him having to stop his giggling. At times, he almost dozes off, still with a smile plastered on his face. You finish your meal. Asterion goes to pick up your dish, as usual. This time, you left a big chunk for him to have, and he smiles as he heads to the kitchen. You bid each other goodnight, and then head to your respective bedrooms for the night. The following morning, as usual, the sound of Asterion's hooves clopping on the floor and the smell of breakfast wakes you up. You wake up, get dressed, and head out to the bedroom. Asterion once again greets you. Good morning, Master. Hope you slept well. After the breakfast routine, this time Asterion served scrambled eggs, ham, and freshly squeezed orange juice. He washes the dishes and returns to you. What are your plans today, Master? Well, it's still pretty early. I think I'm going to stick around here and tinker with my phone a little. See if I can get it to work. What about you? I think... I'll head down to the reception, see if we're lucky enough to get any more guests. So soon? Well, I guess Coda got here soon after we lit the hearth, so it's possible. Oh, before I go, what should I wear today, Master? Is my fur color right? I'm gonna change his clothes as per a request by someone else. Um, I'm gonna put his 40s outfit again. He does look good in this, to be honest. And he fills it up nicely once he gets a little bulkier. I wonder if I can make him go commando. <laughs> nah. That might feel uncomfortable with that type of clothes. Yes. What's the matter, Asterion? Well, I'm debating whether I should tell you this or not, but... I suppose it mustn't mean a lot to you, but I appreciate that Master has been good to me in one sense. What do you mean? Some of the more ruthless Masters enjoyed humiliating me in many ways. Stripping me down and making me walk on all fours, that was a common one. I may be a hybrid, but I am half human. I am not a beast. That came to an end, thankfully. In accordance with the contracts written and signed by previous masters, I am forbidden from exposing myself when we are expecting guests. Neither may I establish a relationship with a guest. I am under a variety of restrictions. Not all of those contracts were written out of kindness, but they were beneficial. I am happy that you haven't attempted to break the rules, Master Emilio. Forgive me for bringing up the subject, but I thought it was important that you know. Very well then, I shall head to reception. Asterion leaves and gives you a smile before closing the door behind him. You sit down on the couch, staring at the door and then the window, and think about how you spend your morning. Luke 1, Stargazing and Whiplash, and actually that's where I'm going to leave it for today. The mess, where it starts. Um, yeah, we're about to be introduced to the second guest of the hotel. But I want to actually... Is he the second guest? 
Because I know people show up before then. Um, but anyways, um, yeah. So, Koda is now officially a member of the hotel staff. And he will be manning the restaurant slash bar for the moment. And, um, yeah. So yeah, we expect to have a, a lot of strict Japanese etiquette uh, when he's manning the bar area. But it's kind of funny anyways too, because... Uh, there's certain interactions that change depending on who you put as the bar uh, person. And yeah, but you guys will get to see that later, don't worry. Um, so what else happened? Well, you also got to change uh, Asterion's fur color. And I'm going to keep it white because I think a white Asterion looks better. And plus, you know, it's nice for Asterion to finally look how he used to look, which is white. <laughs> that sounds so weird. If you think about it. But anyways, um, yeah. Uh, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Minotaur Hotel yourself, there will be a link down in the description. If you would like to support, um, Nanoff, because he's the one with a Patreon, then I will put a link down for that. I think I'm also going to put a link down for, um, all the other Mino or Mino workshop. I forgot what it's called. But it's the group that's working on a whole bunch of other different things, but is also working on Minotaur Hotel. So, um, you know, you can find a whole lot more different stuff by them, too. So I'm going to put a link down for that. And I will also put a link down for, um, Minotaur Hotel's official Twitter account. So, yeah. If there's any updates or anything from them, or any, like, um, what is it called? Fan art? Or stuff that they might, uh, retweet, then, you know, you'll see it there. And, yeah. So, I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye bye